we continue in Romans 2, but since we're way brought up, I'm going to give you all a side lesson first. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew chapter 6. <laughs> no. Now, I don't know who determined how to calculate Easter, but I don't know how it is calculated. It's always the first Sunday at the first full moon after the spring equinox. How they came up with that, I don't know. Nash Wednesday is the first day of Lent, as they call it, which that's when they're, oh, they're six weeks of fasting, they call it, four days. So it flies right in the face of Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, though. Moreover, when you fast, be not as hypocrites of the sad cabinets, for they disfigure their face, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Amen. Mm -hmm. They begin their fasting by marking their face, and that's an exact opposition of what Christ says there. You're right. Amen. And by the way, Mardi Gras or Fat Tuesday is the day before. That's their last big hoorah, their last time to get all their sin in before the Lent. <laughs> that is the origin of Mardi Gras. Mm -hmm. mm. Let's go to Romans chapter 2, the old one will be in our lesson here. Verse number 21 through 24 today, Lord, we're going to look at. <laughs> if you recall from last week's lesson, Paul had pointed out all the things that the, the Jews were thought so highly of themselves about, that they were teachers of babes, that they were, you know, what to say there, that they were guides of the blind, they were lights to those in darkness, they were instructors of the law. Now this week, in these verses, Paul points out their, their biggest flaw. <clears throat> we could sum up these verses in a phrase we all probably know, practice what you preach. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Jews, especially the Pharisees, had a problem with that. I'm afraid many of the Lord's churches have a problem with it though too. Verse 21, he says, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest, a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Verse 22, Thou that sayest, a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Verse 23, Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? Amen. In verse 24, he says, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. Amen. And he begins here with a, a list of things they were doing wrong. And he hits them really from every aspect. Verse 21, he begins with saying, Thou therefore that teachest another. He said, Teachest thou not thyself? But they were teaching others, but they didn't have a right understanding themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's like those people who get up and read a text, and then the lesson or the message has nothing to do with the text. <laughs> uh, that's exactly what they were doing. They were teaching, but they weren't teaching correctly. Amen. He goes on to say next, that Thou that preachest, a man should not steal, dost thou steal? And they were preaching against something here, he was stealing, and they were stealing themselves. It would be almost like if Brother Larry got up and preached against drinking and then went to the bar after services. I don't think Larry's going to do that, but <laughs> that would be the equivalent of it today. Right. Well, they, <clears throat> one doesn't necessarily have to be perfect to preach or teach, but yet it's hypocrisy to actively be involved in the very thing you're teaching or preaching against. Right. And yet the Jews often did that same thing. And we, if not careful, we'll do the same thing. Amen. It seems to be the tendency of the flesh to, to point out our flaws in other people. I don't know if it, to make ourselves feel better or because we're more conscious about it. But it does seem to be the tendency of the flesh that when we have a particular problem, we notice it more than other people. And he goes on next verse to say, <clears throat> Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? This is the classic example of hypocrisy, those who do as I say and not as I do. Right? 
Well, they, they say one thing and they do the opposite. We see that a lot today, don't we? Yet we should never be guilty of it. Here he uses the example of adultery that could be physical or spiritual adultery. Either which way we shouldn't say, well, don't do this and then end up doing it ourselves. If we're not careful, it would be like Peter, like, I will never leave you nor forsake thee. And then, right? Deny God three times before the cock crows. When we, there has to be a, I guess a balance there, you could say, to understand that we are flesh and that we can fall to sin, but <clears throat> that doesn't give us an excuse to, oh, well, that's the flesh. Mm. When he goes on to say, next, thou that a poor idols is thou commit sacrilege. So that's that a poor idols means to detest them, hate them, to be disgusted by them. And so yet they commit sacrilege, which is to, to misuse or desecrate that which is holy. Amen. It literally means to rob the temple. You know, they said they had a problem with idols, they, but yet they didn't have a problem with making idols. This is the type of people who are inconsistent in their behavior. Amen. We may teach or preach or talk against a certain thing, and yet we commit that same sin just in a different fashion. Amen. You'll hear these, they, they value the things of the temple more than the temple itself or even God himself. So they... They said they had a problem with idols. You know, they wouldn't have carved out a, a wooden image or a golden image, but yet they didn't have a problem taking things which were to be used in the service of God and worshiping them. Right. And that's kind of like the Roman crucifix. The cross in and of itself was something to glory in. Paul himself said, God forbid that I should glory saving the cross for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But when we take that image and bow down before it, that's making it an idol. You're right. Uh, well, I, one of the common examples of this, though, this inconsistency in behavior I see today is, I think everyone would say adultery or cheating on your spouse is bad. But yet, by and large, it's acceptable to look at pornography. Mm. And yet the Bible calls that adultery as well. Amen. Who's ever looked at our woman Having her in his heart, have committed adultery already. Amen. Mm -hmm. Paraphrasing, but you know, Paul here he said he gets them from every angle, if you will, from the things they teach and preach to what they say and do. And you know, they are hypocrites in every which way. He says we need to be. Not only careful about what we teach and preach, but how we conduct ourselves as well. Right. Amen. Let's go over to Matthew for a look at a couple of verses here. Matthew chapter 15. Christ never speaks well of the hypocrites. It's an accusation he often gives to the Pharisees and scribes. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 and 8. He says, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy to you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Amen. That is really the true condition of the hypocrites. They, they may speak well, they may talk good things, but yet, their heart is far from God. And if we're not careful, we'll be guilty of the same thing. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll know all the things to say, and even all the things to do outwardly, but our heart won't be close to God. Amen. Well, we're all here, we're faithful to come to the church services on Sunday and be involved, but yet, how close are we really to God in our walk? Right. That's what determines if we're 
being hypocritical or whether we're being true in our service together. Mm -hmm. Go over chapter 24 of Matthew. <clears throat> The last two verses, verses 50 and 51, he had been give, given the example of an evil servant. But I want us to notice what he says here. He says, The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware, and shall cut him asunder, verse 51, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Amen. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For I says, The the portion of the reward, the, the end of the hypocrites, is the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, which is associated with the lake of fire and other scriptures. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't wear the title hypocrite proudly. That's an accusation often given to Christians in God's church, but no, I know when it's sometimes wrongly applied, but sometimes we justly earn that too, don't we? We we'll see, we we'll see here in a few minutes that our testimony does affect how the world views God. Amen. Let's go back to our text for a moment here in Romans two, verse twenty-three. Now, after Paul points out all their hypocrisy, he gives them one last thing that they were very proud of. Verse twenty-three, he says, "Thou that makest thy boast of the law." Through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. If you recall, the Jews were very proud and very self-righteous because of their stance in the law. Because they, especially the Pharisees, they really thought themselves to be something. Right. You know, we see that in the example of the Pharisee and the publican that went up to pray. And the Pharisee bragged about how he wasn't as other men are. They did this and he did that. He didn't do this other thing. <laughs> But he says, here, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. Mm -hmm. We can be all self-righteous and have all this, quote, spiritual pride that we want to, but if we break the law of God, we're dishonoring God. I think sometimes we're guilty of thinking that because we, we have the truth, we have these blessed truths that many others don't have because we're privileged to be part of one of the Lord's churches that somehow we have this higher standing but yet if we're not serving God rightly then we're not honoring Him. Amen. 1 John 3, 4 tells us that sin is the transgression of the law and then again James 2, 10 that even to break the smallest of the commands of God will be guilty of all of it. Amen. Yeah. It says something like, Whoso or shall keep the law and yet offend at one point, he is guilty of all. Our attitude should not be look at me and how good I am. Because we're really not that good in and of ourselves, are we? Amen. The Pharisees did that. They said, they were always look at us and look, we are the best of the best. We are the elite of the class and yet Man. they were not keeping the law in its entirety were they amen christ pointed that out and said you you give the tithes and mint and cumulus and the nine and all these other things yet you leave off the way these matters of the law judgment and faith but if we're not careful we'll do the same thing though we'll put out a very good outward appearance and yet Inwardly, we won't be right with God. Amen. We'll, be, we'll do all the things that make us look good before others, but yet, even if we offend even the smallest of commands, we're guilty of poor God. Yeah. That's a problem among many professing Christians today, is we don't have a right understanding of who God is and His justice. And, nor do we have a right understanding of sin and our sinfulness. Right. We judge sin on a scale of big to small. We think of things such as murder and 
just being really, really bad, and things such as, you know, just telling a little lie that doesn't affect anybody, that's okay. But yet, that's not how God looks upon our judges' sin. Because so you tell that little white lie is just as guilty as the murderer. Mm -hmm. To break even the smallest of command is we are just as guilty as the most wicked of men. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> if we're not careful, we we'll think like these here and put our boast on about what, how good a Christian we are, or how good a servant of God we are. We'll forget that it's only by the grace of God we can even be what we are. Amen. Let's go on to verse 24 here and we'll see the result of <laughs> conducting ourselves as these were. He says, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as is written. He says, this is the result of God's people conducting themselves in such a manner that, that the name of God is blasphemed. He says, that it's spoken evil of, it's reviled, it's spoken irreverent of. That God is not rever revered is largely our fault. I mean, man right. certainly is wicked and his nature is against God, but because of our corrupt testimony, man looks upon God in a blasphemous way. He looks upon God in contempt. You know, this name of God here, it could mean literally his name, you know, such as when they use Jesus Christ as a curse word, or mm -hmm. it also can refer to his character, who God is. Right. Today you hear things like, well, why would I want to serve God when Christians act like that? That's not a, a good thing to be said about us. Or because we're not doing what we ought to, people don't have the right view of God, and they equate, equate him to a genie in a bottle. Well, our not only what we preach and teach, but how we conduct ourselves is ultimately what teaches the world who God is. Amen. We can have all the right doctrines in the world, but if we're proud and arrogant about it, the world's not going to look favorably upon God or God's people. Amen. We can live a very pious life, and yet if we're not we don't have compassion and love towards the lost and those who are destitute and the world's not going to look very favorably upon God and his people. Right. And we go, he says there that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. Now that was not among the Gentile believers, but among those who were of the world. You know, the Jews were God's people and now it is us as his church that we are to be a light in the world around us. And yet, mm -hmm. if we are not living and serving God as we ought to, the world's not, it's not going to have a right understanding of God. They're not going to, you know, they're going to look and say, well, I don't want to be associated with that bunch of stuck up people. You know, that's not a good testimony for God's people to have. Yet I'm, Amen. I'm afraid it is the testimony of many churches today. I'm saying we shouldn't go all the other side when it's not, there's no truth or gospel left either. We have many churches today, all they are is entertainment centers for the Lord. Right. Amen. But no, we must live and teach the truth. We can't just do one or the other or leave off both. But he says here, he's blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. It was because of these Jews here and how they lived their lives and how they conducted themselves that God was blasphemed. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a terrible charge against God's people that the name of God will be blasphemed because of how we live, because how we conduct ourselves. Yeah, I'm afraid that 
It happened many times a day as well. But because of the, you know, we may be teaching truth, but are we living in that truth? Right. We may be, we have the truth of the Word of God. We know exactly how God has told us to live our lives and the things we are to do and not to do. But yet are we like the Pharisees and very proud about it? I thank you, Lord, I'm not as other men are. I'm not as extortioner or adulterer or even as this publican. Mm. We might, I know we don't say those things, but do we act and live that way? Right. You can be sure the world sees that. And they're going to look upon God and his church with contempt if we live that way. You know, I know natural man is going to reject God ultimately without the grace of God being applied to his life. But we should never be the reason that man looks at Upon God and says, No, I don't want anything to do with that. Right. We conclude that verse there with, As it is written. <clears throat> so, God already told the Israelites this would happen. And it happens today again with God's people today. You know, it's uncertain exactly where Paul is referring to here, but some think. Isaiah 52, 5. Turn there and read that real quick. Isaiah 52, 5. We're we'll going to read verse 4 as well. It says, For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down before time into Egypt, and so to sojourn there, and the Assyrians oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my name is continually, every day is blasphemed. Therefore my people shall know my name, and therefore shall they know in that day that I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. Amen. Yeah, I don't know exactly <clears throat> what the Jews were doing at this time. They're, apparently they were living in such a way that the name of God was blasphemed he says continually every day mm -hmm. so they were taken in captivity by the Assyrians and oppressed by them but knowing the Jews they were probably very very much complaining and murmuring about their situation right so the, I'm sure the, the enemy looked down and said, well, I don't, they're just a bunch of complainers. They're, or their God is not answering them. We turn over to Psalm 74, we can see a similar passage here. Psalm 74 and verse 10, verse 18 as well. It says, O God, how long shall the adversary approach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? But he goes, he goes on now in verse 18. He says, Remember this, that the enemy hath reproached, O Lord, that the foolish people have blasphemed thy name. And one day there will be more blasphemy when they stand in the God. But it will, it will be a mark against us, though. They blaspheme God because of the way we live. Mm -hmm. Turn over to Leviticus and look one more place and we'll close there. Leviticus 24. Mm -hmm. This was the law against blaspheming in the name of God. Leviticus 24, verse 16. Mm -hmm. It says, and he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well as the stranger, as, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord God, shall he be put, shall be put to death. Amen. Mm -hmm. There was no, no glossing over it under the law, was there? Mm -hmm. And God will not wink over it when 
we stand before him. And the world is judged. They'll answer for their blasphemy against his name. We get it's not a good thing against us that they blaspheme because of the way we live. And right. Says. But we'll have to give an account for that as well. But let it not be said of us that the name of God is blasphemed among the world. Rather, let it be said of us that we let our light so shine that men may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. So there is, I said before, there is a wrong way to do the right thing. Right. I'm afraid many, even good sovereign grace Baptists, are guilty of that. You're right. And we ought not to do one part of the command and leave the other undone. Rather, we must live our lives consistently with the Word of God. That the world may see our testimony, that the world may see the grace of God in our lives. It's almost like those who, who tell others about Christ and almost seem mad about it. Right. That's not consistent with the gospel. We live in a world that's all love and unicorn and fairy tales, but there is a place for love and passion in the life of a Christian. Amen. Mm -hmm. But there is still a place for calling sin for what it is as well. You're right. Let's go ahead and close with that talk. We'll pick up the word one next week. Amen. Amen.